Welcome to this episode of Meet the Artist at Frame for All. My name is Ben Kuzel, and in this episode, we'll be doing something a little bit different. Having had the opportunity to talk with insanely gifted animators, I've seen how most of them are influenced by other creative endeavors as well, that above all, they're artists. So today we'll talk to someone who is definitely that, an artist. Martin Murphy spent nearly 17 years at ILM in visual effects as a texture artist and model on. He worked on amazing projects like Rango, Pirates of the Caribbean, pretty much all of them, uh, Pacific Rim, Transformers, Jurassic World, and many, many more. Before this, he performed in theater. So for 13 years, he, he was touring Canada and the US with productions like Cats, Phantom of the Opera, and Sunset Boulevard. And almost three years ago, Martin finally left ILM to pursue a full-time uh, artist life. Um, and this is where we catch him now in the midst of oil painting and gallery hunting. I had an amazing talk with Martin. He was so inspiring and I'm sure you'll find him hilarious and inspiring as well. And as always, if you're an animator looking for community and feedback, come check out framepro.io. Great artists, great vibes and customized feedback tools all available for free at framefro.io. And now here's Martin Murphy. There's also a bright side to it. it it's, it's taking you to all these places and, and uh, through all these adventures and awards and, and, and stories, oh, stories. That's the most important stories. thing. That is the most important thing at the, at the, yeah. I hate saying that, that phrase again and again, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, Stories to tell are the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, like, um, yeah, I know that. Like, yeah, yeah, you're really busy, so I really appreciate you doing this, man. It's. Uh, it, it's... Uh, yeah, I'm okay. Actually, this works better today than um, our original plan was for tomorrow. Yeah. Like, drive around a bunch of paintings and the bad weather here in vancouver so yeah 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 really bad so this is actually working out great mm, oh, that's good i was um yeah i was i was i was gonna ask about your new career and uh you would you were just saying uh, you were just kind of like alluding to your theater days because it's like you've been living these very different lives but at a very high professional level and uh now you ah uh, <laughs> you're being modest <laughs> Uh, but yeah, your newest venture is, is uh, yeah, we can see some of it behind you, the the oil painting. So it's like complete, like fine art. Yeah. How, yeah. how are you finding it? Um, so here's my journey, right? Like I do these, I have these hobbies that I always say that get out of hand, right? Like the theater <laughs> thing was a hobby. <laughs> it just turned into 15 years of of a full-time career and it just started off as just something fun to do mm. and this may be a little bit more um of a through line through my whole life like i've always been painting ever since i was a kid it's mm. just something i just picked up the brushes as a kid and just started doing um but learning to do it in the industry that i know nothing about I just, you know, you, you leave, I left visual effects again after another 15 years and I thought I'll just paint paintings and people will buy them and then <laughs> they're, they're living the dream, you know, and it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah. It, it is just, it's an incredibly different world of your work being subjective, mm. right? In visual effects, it doesn't look real. Does it fit in the shot? Does it pull your eye? Yeah. Done. But here, everything is subjective. Everything, the size of your canvas, your subject, how you paint, what city you want to hang your artwork in, because that's all important. Every city's got like a flavor, right? Oh. So it's it's just been an incredible learning experience for me. Painting during the day, during the daylight hours, and at night, I don't know if you can see it. I've got my co cozy chair over here yeah. and I turn it towards the TV and I just watch these lectures and other artists on YouTube and just drink in this whole industry of fine art 
Wow. Uh, different cities and how it works and how to get into a gallery. And maybe I don't want to get into a gallery or gallery's dead. Like there's all this stuff that I knew nothing about. Mm. And, um, and even just painting techniques and, and tools of the trade and all that stuff. And it was just like ugh, so much stuff that I thought I kind of knew because I've been painting for like 30 years or whatever, but, but all oh, a huge, huge surprise yeah and, uh learning curve huge learning curve oh yeah and then on the side just making sure that your work is at least you know pleasant <laughs> <laughs> at least you know um, yeah. but like i said it's all subjective it really mm. is just when i think oh this is great i get you know negative feedback and mm. um so it's like oh okay yeah 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 it's it's um I've, I've i'm so excited about this conversation because I was um, I was talking to my friend Marco, who's a previous supervisor in France, who talked a lot about building bridges between the different genres in film and VFX. And um, I talked to uh, my friend Sydney Padua. I think I mentioned her, who's an amazing artist. She did a, a graphic novel, and then she also mm-hmm. works in VFX as an animator. Uh, uh, and they kind of made me think that. M- that maybe I should kind of like kind of branch out a bit and talk to creatives in general and especially those renaissance people like yourself who who manages manages to master several disciplines to talk about what do we have in common and how can we you know how can we learn and 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 um like you 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 were just kind of alluding to your career in theater where you had was it 13 or 15 years and uh, and then Somewhere in there, yeah. yeah and now you've just uh, done and that uh, at, at a very high level you're touring and doing it what was it, uh, like several very high um and known uh, pieces all across uh, canada and us and then you just finished a sprint well you, three years ago you finished 15 years in the visual effects at ilm at like and VES awards and and pretty much how like pushing the the limit of how far you can take it and now you're you're into a new thing. <laughs> Throw all that fucking garbage. And start a new career. <laughs> no, but you you were just you were just talking about I I know I'm skipping ahead a bit. I'm just getting excited, but. Uh, uh, you're talking about this this new thing about like what about galleries and the steep learning curve and and I feel like that steep learning curve must to some degree feel familiar from having tried it in theater, which is so demanding and then in VFX that that's the one I know that I know that that can also be very demanding. Do you find this this way you are now familiar? Absolutely. But Mm. it's more familiar, I think, with the theater stuff, because with theater, you have to be so prepared, right? There's Mm. so much rehearsal and there's so much um, training you have to do even before walking into an audition. So I was sort of mentally, I knew, all right, I got a lot of work ahead of me and um, get to know this new industry, do your research. Um, be extremely open to new stuff and embrace, throw out preconceived notions, embrace anything new and just try to be as fluid and flexible as I possibly can. But uh, yeah, so theater would be a closer match and just budgeting Mm. money, budgeting time, right? So when I left visual effects, I had a nice, uh, nice little nest egg that I've been saving up for because I knew this time would come. I thought it would be a little bit later in life, but <laughs> that's okay. But I knew this time would come where I wanted to focus on my art only and just to see, right? Will I crash and burn? Will I, will it turn into something successful? I honestly didn't know. Mm. So I knew I had X amount of time before the money ran out <laughs> um, to make a decision, right? So mm. That's sort of where I am now. And I'm two and a half years in, which is remarkable what you can do with nothing. (laughs) With being, you know, living very humbly. Mm. Uh, I've been lucky that um, um, the con, this tiny little condo I live in is is fairly inexpensive to just to keep going. And Mm. um, so that kind of a thing. But 
I do have my eye on how long I can go before it's time to, you know, perhaps either put it to a side, put it back as a hobby and mm. get back into the more concrete workforce. Yeah. I, yeah. Theater was like that. Yeah. You know? did, did you have, did you have, uh, uh, a, did you have an idea of how long you wanted to pursue theater? Because that's quite a while ago or, and, and, and I was also going to ask, uh, how, how, how trained were you when you got into theater? Oh God, it's a, it's a funny, it's not a funny story. It's a sad story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say it's not even a sad story. I was so young. I was 20, I, God, I think I was 21. Mm. Um, when I got the theater bug, like the official, I was doing community theater like in high school when I was like probably 15 or 16, my dad was doing it because there's a lot of like artsy people in my family, like my sister sings and my dad sings and my mom is an antique dealer and there's lots of creative people in my family. Mm. And um, uh, so I was in musical theater when I was quite young. And then um, I saw this show at a theme park. I saw this huge expensive production at Canada's Wonderland. And this was um, many years ago. This was like 1981. Mm. And they had a small orchestra pit and these giant sets that like rose up and disappeared into the rafters. And I, you know, this is me living in a town called Unionville, a tiny <laughs> little town. We literally had a barn. <laughs> like, I was not exposed to any kind of live entertainment at all. And I just saw it and I was like, whoa, it, this is incredible. And these people were so talented. And um, it was this fantasy, right, of, of performing and the orchestra and all that stuff. So um, I started working at that park, at that theme park, the first year it opened as an usher. Mm. But then that, I could watch the show every night and I watch it and I was able to sort of pick up the choreography and I thought, okay. And then I met another usher who was a dancer and she's like, you got to take classes at my studio. So I said, oh, okay. I've never done that before. So I went, started taking classes. And I think after about a year and a half, I got my first crappy job. But like one job, you meet a bunch of people in theater. It, they're so close. Like theater people are very... It really is a family. Mm. You get um, very close to people very quickly. And um, like the theater people in my life are still my longest and dearest and closest friends. Oh. Like when I go to Toronto, when I go back to Toronto, where I'm uh, originally from, all my friends are theater friends. Um, so uh, one job led to another and then it just kind of grows. And I was in art college and I was sort of getting... I never really fit in in my art college, um, just probably because I was had this theater bug and I was going to theater or going to art class, uh, college in the afternoons and the mornings. And then I had this waiter job that I did as a waiter, a couple of nights to, to feed myself. But then right across the street was the dance studio. And I would just be this art guy with this dance bag on his shoulder. So I was doing those three things I remember for like two years and it just killed me, but I was mm. loving it. Mm. And I was so thin. I remember I was like <laughs> 150 pounds or something and six feet tall. Like I was like super tall and lanky. And, um, but I was loving it and I was getting better at the dancing and the art was fine. It was, it came a little bit easier for me. Um, so I kind of lost a little bit of interest in that. And then I got this gig, this theater gig performing in France for a summer in another theme park. And I was like, I got to take this. And I went to my dad and my mom and I went, if I take this job, you know how much I wanted to do theater for now for like a couple of years. And it's a really cool opportunity to work in France. And I expected them to go, are you out of your mind? Because I would have to leave my final year of art college. Oh. And my dad gave me the best advice. And I always sort of lend this out to anybody. He said, do it while you're young. And I was pretty young at the time. Mm. Um, just old enough to drink, if I remember. <laughs> like 21. And uh, maybe even 20. I don't know. Anyway, so I left art college. And I packed my bags. And I went to France for the summer. Changed my life, right? You mm. meet, once again, you meet more people and more connections. And, you know, it was a... 
working in Europe for a summer was incredible for this small town kid. So it, you grow up pretty quickly. Mm. And then I got back and I was like in a music video and then I was in this and then I got an audition for this. And then the next thing I was in Cats, which was wow. back in the 80s, the biggest production, at least around and and at least in Canada for sure. Mm. And um, pretty inexperienced. I mean, as a as a dancer, same as when I joined, started visual effects, I was never really that good, but I had awesome luck with people that gave me a break. Mm. And um, I guess they saw potential or whatever. So with cats, I wasn't great, but I was good that they gave me like a shot at it. And then you just learn and you get better. And once again, you meet even more people and, and the higher level of performers and you just build and build and build mm. um, from there. And then, you know, once that, once that production, it was two and a half years doing that and it went across Canada and back. And then um, that, you know, one show led to another. And then I think I left at 37. That's when I was like physically burnt out. Wow. Yeah. That's and, like an uh, athlete's uh, span of career, like. Oh yeah, and the, that's like one amazing thing from theater, like that I I'm always thankful for. Like your body is a machine. Oh, like, I you bet. can wake up and drop in the splits. And I remember, like, I was drinking and I was smoking back in the day. <laughs> like, I was living life. And, <laughs> nice. uh, it was like, like just young, crazy dancers. Like, uh, it was just unbelievable. Some mm. of the best friends and the craziest stories that, you know, that, uh, that, um, that come out of that career was, is, is just absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, but same with the visual effects too. Like the, I only worked for ILM. That's the only visual effects company I worked for. And in total, it was like 16 and a half years. Wow. And, I went in, I had not done any visual effects before. Yeah, I wanted to ask, how did you, so if you, you, you left theater feeling, feeling like your body is, is needs a break. And then what, what made you, was it just thinking back, painting, art school, like, like what, what led you to VFX? Um, I remember I was in, um, in, uh, the production office and I was doing, um, Sunset Boulevard with Diane Carroll. <laughs> and, uh, there was lots of time off at that show. One of the easiest, most incredible experiences, but not a very particularly difficult show to do as a chorus person, which I was. Um, so remember, like in between, in between numbers, we we're all hanging out in the production office or whatever, and sh someone showed me a computer with, I think it had like paint on it. What's it called? The the, it's just back in like ninety. Oh, just like the Microsoft what? Paint? like Yeah, yeah, it was Microsoft Paint. And I was like, wow. what? That's crazy. <laughs> Somebody had a bus. They're like, look, Martin, you're an artist. Look what you can do in the computer. And that was it. I saw that and I was like, what? <laughs> I bought a computer, a printer, and a monitor. And I went on tour with that. So after the shows, I'd get home at 1130 at night. Then I would play on my computer. And I would have these user manuals on my lap and I would just be learning how to do all this stuff. And I bought, you know, the basic programs back in the day, like Bryce and like early 3D stuff and um, Illustrator and Photoshop and all this stuff back in the, it was in 95, I think was the first computer I got, it was 1995. And just taught myself how to do it. Wow. And, um, the production people on tour were great because I would put these monitors and computers and the printers in these giant boxes. And we were only allocated like certain amount of suitcases for them to, to bring around, but they were so nice and they um, shipped all my computer stuff to <laughs> all these cities. But then I would do posters for their um, events and oh. I would chip in and do all that stuff. So I would, I would help out. Did you already, nice. Did you already feel that you were kind of like leaving like getting into this new thing because it sounds i don't want to analyze but it sounds a little bit like what you talked about you were like almost kind of like leaning out of art school when you were getting into theater and dancing a lot 
and this seems like you were really excited about this computer while you were still doing the theater. Did it? Yeah. Did it have that flavor to it, or? It did have that flavor. Yeah, it was another um, dangly, shiny object that I was like, oh, look, something new. <laughs> and um, I would, it was a few years before I actually left, like a, like a couple, like two, maybe a year and a half or two years of me traveling around with, the, with these boxes and just learning how to do 3D and stuff. And then, you know, when the body get, lets go, you're like, you're done. I thought, uh, okay, now, switch gears let's just do this and see what you can do so i made a little website and i would do anything for anybody i would do your business cards i would do anything to work on the computer and just learn and i had this job working for a toronto um, theater production company and i would do all their ad for their newspaper and everything so i was learning how to do it and these templates and like going to you know they drop off these ads at um, the newspaper companies and like learn how to work with a printer and what you need to deliver the stuff and all that so i was like learning on the go eating it all up loving it mm. and then um i got asked to work in a for a computer game company um digital extremes so i worked for them i thought yeah this is great worked for them for two years um but i'm not a gamer Mm. So it, I learned a lot and that company was amazing. And I thank them for all their awesome support and opportunity they gave me, but I wasn't a gamer. Um, my heart was in for the art, but not in for the, the gaming. And those mm. guys, I don't know if you've ever worked in games, like it is I, long I days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be. Yeah. So they would finish work. And um, they would stay at the office and play games till midnight. <laughs> I could hear the like <laughs> in all the offices around me, and I'm like packing up my stuff, putting my jacket on. I'm like, wow, these guys are. This is their love, right? This is, yeah, you know, this is yeah. their passion, and it wasn't mine. So mm. after two years, it was like, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going into movies. That I, I, I love that. You, that's a, that's the sentiment, and then you just go for it. What was the was this uh, this was your first experience doing textures for three D uh, models? Yeah, correct. Like um, I was teaching myself how to do it, um, but in production, yeah, it was mm. the first time doing it exactly right and um, just technically how to do it correctly and UVs doing them correctly. I had um, I spent a fortune on software. Like I used light wave for mm. everything and i was like modeling viewing texturing rigging animating all that stuff in light wave right and oh. um so i could get something from the first polygon to a finished render with this one software which was fantastic um so when i left the game company i thought i'm going to spend two months and put a reel together and some animations and i got some art that i've already done and i'm gonna put a reel together and you know back in the day vhs and then mail these <laughs> out to to all these different companies you know and like you're so naive you don't realize how <laughs> what a, a complete disaster it could be right you know if it's not good and you're just like sending your stuff in blindly Mm. it's but it was a different world it was a different such a different time back then right like yeah not a lot of people had home computers people were just starting to get them in and you couldn't buy off the shelf software like you can now to do 3d mm. um, it was all propri proprietary or if you had like big bucks you could you know maya was just coming out it was just the beginning and it was like four grand or something crazy yeah, yeah. it's like super expensive so um uh light wave was affordable mm. so uh that's and, what i used and you by that time so you had uh, taught yourself to do what i think they used to call hero characters where you did everything was that the case yeah that's yeah. amazing a, yeah well they're not great <laughs> <laughs> no no but i mean that's that's a lot of acquired knowledge, you know, that you had to figure out. I know I used to just stay at home and I just ate that stuff up. Like, I mm. think I have this like 
when I find something, I just, you know, grab onto it like a, like I was super passionate about it. It was just so new and yeah. this like 3D was in all these films and blowing people away. And it was just this new thing. And um, I was lucky that I was familiar with the computer and all that stuff, but the 3D was still pretty new. And mm. um, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. And I did this animated movie like two minutes with this little bird and a fish and <laughs> I still have it it's still around oh. no one will ever see it, but I still have it <laughs> um yeah and I submitted it to Seagraph for the light wave thing and it got picked to show at this that's thing. amazing um so I made my little VHS and I thought I'm going to start at the top and then work my way down. I'll send it to ILM and if I don't go to ILM, I'll get down. So mm. um, I sent it to a bunch of people and um, I got interviews at Seagraph in um, Texas. And uh, I remember the, the, the girl from ILM said, well, we'd like to come, you know, we'd like you to come for an interview. We're going to be at Seagraph. She goes, but don't come all the way down from Toronto just for us. I was like, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> right when ILM calls, you know, and I was stuck just like exactly like I'm like in this tiny little room, <laughs> plugging away morning, noon and night, just focusing, you know, burning brain cells, learning all this stuff. And then ILM's like, we'd like an interview. It's like my bags are packed. Mm. So um, it was pretty amazing. So I flew down to San Antonio, Texas and um it was in a, it was super hot i remember that it was like 115 degrees and it was in the um I can't remember it was like in the, it was cold because i wasn't used to the heat um, mm. living in toronto and uh had amazing i had like two interviews that day one they were not so great and they were like literally gave me a t-shirt thank you very much see you later <laughs> and then i went to ilm's interview and it was completely different they were just so nice and wonderful and complimentary and um by the time i walked back to my hotel i had a little flashing light on my phone and they said you got a job and i was like what wow. and it was for just like a six month contract for pirates of the caribbean the first one um yeah and they were like how soon can you be here and i'm like i don't know and then i had to get a visa and because I didn't finish my college, that makes things messy. Uh, to get yeah, a visa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, God. <laughs> In school, kids. <laughs> so um, uh, they finally worked it out. And then I drove there from Toronto with a computer, a pillow, and some clothes in the back seat. I thought it was going to be six months. And then six months turned into 14 years down there. And oh. then, then I came back to. Vancouver and did two more years with and them up here. That that beginning, how did you feel walking into that? Because if at the time it was already iconic as it is now, um, and that's you're a, quite a you know you're a junior at the time and big production. And how 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 were the, those early days where where you know like did you feel okay getting feedback? Like did did you were you just very excited or how did how did it did it all feel? They, it, and, God, it, once again, it was a different time. Mm. Um, they were like one of the only companies going, right? It was just after 9-11. Like I went in 2002 mm. and um, it was just different. Um, George Lucas was there often mm. and it was, a, it was a bit more uh, a small, much smaller company. We were up in Kerner. Um, I don't know. It was. It was just. A, it was. Um, I don't know. When like six o'clock came, people left. Yeah. And the day was done, and um, everything was there. They were blowing up pirate ships over here, and they were building the sets for Star Wars on, you know, over here, and it was just this incredible experience. Wow. But they were very gentle. Um, I had three weeks of training. And um, which is outrageous when, yeah. you know, now it's like you got four hours, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your first shot. But I'm joking. Not really. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was three weeks of training and um, just to learn 
their software at the time because it was all mostly their um, proprietary work and what else did I have to learn? Oh, soft image. <gasps> oh, God. right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was they were just moving from soft into um, was it Maya? I think it was Maya. They were going from NURBS to polygons. Mm. Um, so I did. There was a couple of shows where we did everything in NURBS, like the first pirates, and then I think the second pirates. I could be wrong, but I think the second one, Dead Man's Chest, was the first with just polygons. Mm -hmm. So I had already, I knew polygon, that was my world. So I was like, woohoo, so it was perfect mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. So I knew, you know, I could lay out the UVs and do all that stuff and it was great. So I was, I was, I felt more comfortable mm -hmm. than uh, the nerds, but they were great. They, it was, they taught you everything. They were, you know, they didn't give you too much. They, um, you know, uh, Jeff Campbell was my mentor. He was just incredible and, um, yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was a wonderful, easy experience. And of course, when you're there and you're new, um, you eat it up, right? And so you stay late and you play on learning how to do stuff. And, you, and it was just a wonderful experience. Yeah, it sounded like you were so um, fueled by the curiosity and just hung, hungry for knowledge and, and pursuing that uh, skill. Um, the Yeah. I, I, I was wondering how long did you did you stay hungry for like when did you start pursuing leadership was that because I it, it sounded like you were so caught up in the doing of it that you just wanted to you know be with your work and then pursue leadership for a while or, or did it come soon um I never pursued leadership I remember I got asked to be a lead on something and mm. I was I turned the first couple down. Like sometimes there are very <laughs> small shows, right? There yeah. where you don't need like more. I was a, started off as a modeler, so they only needed oh, one right. or two modelers, right? So, um, but I didn't know anything about leadership. I didn't even know what it, what it was involved or anything. And um, uh, but that oh god, that's a, this is a whole other conversation. Like leadership is harder than it looks <laughs> it sounds great and it probably looks great on a resume but it is a skill mm. and it's a skill that some people are, are better at and some people i guess work at but um it's trying to be getting the stuff through the pipeline as as best it can mm. with mentoring at the same time and working with production and you know you have different kinds of personalities that mm. are stressed out and working like it is so complicated and then you're working now with different cities so you've got singapore with ilm and san francisco and london and vancouver and you're yeah. going from one meeting room to another and checking in on how they're doing and getting to know their artists so mm. it is it, it is a definite skill and a definite, completely different world than just mm. being at the box and, <clears throat> yeah. you know, mastering your your uh, your software or mastering your skills at doing whatever you need to do. Yeah, yeah, because I'm curious because you're so, uh, you, f from what you tell, you seem so driven by the, the, the le by one, learning the craft and, and pers pursuing the, art the artistic side of it, that it, it it almost sounds like asking to be a lead or a soup would be almost like a disruption of whatever you were doing. I can almost see you sitting doing your thing and someone taps you on the shoulder and you're like, what? But it's, it's, uh, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's from also from the, the soups that I've been lucky to, to have on here, like it's, it, it's it's such a different thing than just animating or or or, or doing your own models or textures or, or what it is you're doing, and um, it, yeah, I could just imagine that you would kind of like postpone it a while uh, while so so yeah. I w did you did was that a big challenge for you? Eventually combining the two, like keeping your own fire going while also having to juggle all these uh, responsibilities. Absolutely. 
So mm. one of my greatest fears is being anyone's disappointment, right? That mm. always is my thing. So sometimes it keeps me from doing things or keeps, keeps me from trying things um or you know keeps me up at night worrying about it so that is um just a stupid thing for me but um so i didn't want to do it at first um just because you're right it does take you away from sinking your teeth into an awesome asset as a texture artist or a modeler or something like that but um I don't know. It, it was okay. I thought, okay, I can do this. I can, I can manage. And it's, it's, it, it certainly brings your um, skill level up because you've got to go to meetings and when to talk and when not to talk and, you know, what, you know, what battle to pick to fight for this. And when you, you know, you got to learn all that kind of a thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't great at it when I first started because I was this, you know, crazy theater guy from, from Canada. And I was in there and I raised a couple of eyebrows for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I even remember like after a meeting, it was one of my first supervisory jobs and they were like, <laughs> I'm like, you got to be a bit more tactful. And I wasn't being insulting, but I was being way too comfortable mm. and, um, I just had to sort of dial it down a bit and just be a little bit more focused and sensitive, I guess. And uh, mm. so that was upsetting for me at first, but then it was like, wow, that was a huge life lesson right there. So it was like, you know, you got to thank, thank who was ever involved in that. And it was like, oh, okay, wow, that was, that was, I needed that. So that was great. Mm. And um, so that was, that was an important little bit of feedback for sure. Um, just about you're not behind your desk, you know, hanging and making jokes with your, with your buddies, you know, it's yeah. your, the directors on the screen or, you know, producers or whatever. And there's, you know, you know, meeting rooms full of people and you just have to know when to talk and when not to talk and mm. what's important and just have, um, priorities about the days, you know, what needs to be done in, during the day. Mm. Yeah, that's it. It's it's it sounds a lot like uh, I a while ago I talked to Aaron Gilman, who's uh, well, he's a, a head of creative at Steamroller Studios, but he used to be uh, anim director at Dinek. He's a good friend of mine, and he talked about how leadership is essentially just about relationships, and it sounds like it's it sounds like what you're saying as well. It it, it that it that you have to kind of learn some skills that has nothing to do with your craft per se, Absolutely. but it's just about the dealing with the people around it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Name drop again. Same guy, Jeff Campbell. Um, this guy has, as, as long as I've known him, he's been a supervisor and he's always been so right there all the time. So mm. never lost it never I, I think i even told him that and he was just like what are you crazy and i'm like yeah he was always my goal of just such an even temperament mm. he looks out for his artists you know making sure that they're you know not overworked and mentally in a good spot and inspired and all that stuff but he's he's really good you know with the technical aspect and what's needed for the assets and he's respected and, and liked and everything. And it was just like, I don't want, when I grow up, I'm going to be like that. So <laughs> he was a great, um, great mentor mm. uh, when it comes to, um, supervisory stuff. He was just great. Yeah. It's funny. So my goal was never to lose it. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I think, I, I don't think I was that good. Cause I lost, I've lost it many a time, many a time. Well, I also, <laughs> I also, we, we we only met at the 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 ILM bar in in Vancouver when I was kind of sneaking over from Dinek and hang out with you guys, uh, and uh, the friends we have in common that's how they would describe you as as extremely skilled and uh, and uh, you know you have all the technical stuff down but you're also very protective of your artist and and you you know you you like the even kill stuff uh, comes to mind. I only met you after, like, it was like after beer o'clock, so I, I never got the work experience. 
<laughs> but 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 it it uh, it it it's it's how they would describe you. So yeah, thank Jeff Campbell for that. Like mm. he, you know, he's the guy. He's he's that. Um, just like I said, just that even keel, always, just like soft spoken, got stuff done, managed massive productions like mm. you know, like the first pirates they didn't even know how they were going to do all this crumbly flesh and and like layers upon layers upon layers how they, how we were going to build all this stuff and it's got the hair on it and all the face shapes how is that going to work with when there's just nothing there and uh, mm. so just figuring all that stuff out it was just amazing i was just like wow it's incredible. yeah yeah and it well it uh, I was going to ask about how, like, how it progressed for you as I learned, because you eventually won uh, a VES award and you got no nominated for a few more, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, was that for your work on um, Pirates? Um, I can't remember which one. One was the, 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 uh, the Octopus. Oh, yeah, it's Rango. It's Rango, right? Rango. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was amazing. Oh. Okay, we have to talk about Rango. Rango yeah. was on uh, an, an incredible experience that was one of those shows it was two years like so many assets right um yeah. i watch it now i'm like how the hell did we get through that that was incredible the first time i had ever done anything like that it was unbelievable mm. um uh oh i lost my train of thought just thinking about Rango stories. No, just the scope uh, of the project, and then also just from watching the film, it's it's. Oh, the beautiful. BES, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I know what I was going to talk about for Rango. The one of the great things that I think got us through that show was they locked down the versions of the software that we were using, mm. so there was no more updates, no more trials, no more betas, no more anything like that. They're like, all right, this show ends on this version of this for everything. And then just stuff just flies out, right? Because you don't yeah. have to worry. Everything's working. Everything is humming. And it was like a well-oiled machine. And by the end of it, it was just a fantastic, fantastic, um, productive uh, production. I'm sure other people have other crazy stories about timing and everything. But of course. at least for the assets and stuff, it was pretty pretty amazing. And just the just to be able to sink your teeth into those filthy, dirty, you know, characters that yeah. all had to be quite well created because we never knew when the director was going to put one and swap one from the back. The background guys always got stuck in the front for some reason. <laughs> I'd go back into production to get, you know, fixed up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the VES for that one for the town um, as a texture artist. And then I got nominated for the baby on Lemony Snicket's a series of unfortunate events. Oh. So there's a baby. Um, <laughs> that was one of those productions where I was pretty much the only modeler, but I had two other um, people that came and left during the production, maybe three. Mm. And uh, there was no, technically no supervisor. Jeff Campbell was sort of overseeing, but he was on another show. Um, but it was, you know, build this lifelike baby that's going to be this close to the camera. Wow. And um, yeah, that was that was an unbelievable thing. I watch, I look back at that now. It's always fun to look back at stuff, you know, yeah, and just yeah, see yeah. how it comes up. And some stuff does, and some stuff doesn't. But once again, ILM gave me another break on that because they needed some digital matte painters. They're like, Martin, we got a few shots you free and i was like i could squeeze that in so i got some matte painting in and they yeah. were literally just paintings oh that's uh, amazing yeah so it was like really cool that uh i have a few few of those in that movie as well as being the model lead which is great i wanted to hear about that too because uh modeling and texturing like when did texture like did you did you did was it like a like a wanting to uh, get back to some of the painting you had done uh, when you were younger or how how did you manage to get that introduced and why god that's actually a really good question um i was trying to think when that um when 
when the texturing actually began. I think I was sort of dabbling with it a little bit at the end of the second Pirates. Mm. And I was building all those little crabs and sea creatures and everything that would, you know, Johnny Depp would walk by and they'd all move. And I remember I, had, I built and I painted those, which I thought was so much fun. But I didn't know how to actually put the textures on the object through their um, view paint software, which I didn't know. Mm. But I could do the textures in like um, ZBrush or something mm. and then pass them on. So I think I started like that, if I remember. Um, and then at the end of, um, oh, the first Pirates of the Curse of the Black Pearl. Curse of the Black Pearl. Yeah, sorry. Somebody was probably heard me say that like 10 minutes ago and went, no, we got it wrong. <laughs> Dead Man's Chest was the second one. So yeah, so Dead Man's Chest. Yeah. After that, I was burnt out again. Oh. And um, yeah, and I got a call at my desk saying, George Lucas is doing this little secret project and he's needs like a handful of people to work at Skywalker Ranch on this. And I was like, I am in, this is perfect. And they said, you're gonna be the model lead and the, mod the only modeler and the only texture artist. And I was like, uh, okay. Whoa. So it was just like five of us. And we went and worked at the ranch with him on this secret project, which ended up sort of morphing and changing and it ended up being strange magic. Oh, But wow. it was a much different looking, I guess, project back in the day. Mm. And um, we, they brought in, um, am I allowed to say this? They brought in Brian Froud for, I don't know if I can say that. I'm probably going to get canceled. Well, 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 I'll, I'll let you have a look at yeah. it. Yeah, they yeah. brought we'll, him we'll in. I, I think he's on the credits. I think he's on the credits. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure it out. They brought him in for two weeks and they were like, Martin, do you want to work on this project? And it's going to be with Brian Froud. And I was like, what? Because he is like one of my all-time inspirations oh. um so i was like i'd like literally like flip my table at ILM, and like ran to the ranch <laughs> and you and said I you were, that's amazing and you said you were burned out at the time the, oh what... fried at the end of dead man's chest we mm. were all fried like mm. all that facial stuff you know every shot had to be once the end it went through animation and it was bought off on all the modelers were assigned every single shot to fix the penetrations and right. make oh. sure the lips were exactly right, like hours and hours, sometimes a couple of days on a shot, just fixing the the, the, the speaking of the lips on yeah. all those characters, right? Because they were all CG. Um, so we were all fried. Mm. I mean, the show looks fantastic even today. Like, oh, it yeah. is unbelievable. Uh, it's I mean... another one of those where you watch and you're like, wow, that is so yeah. much work. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so I did and went to the ranch for two years. So the first year was working on this secret project that kind of started to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then George got busy with, um, red tails. I think it was, it was right around that time. Mm. And he said, okay, this is, I'm not ready for this. I'm not exactly sure the story, but it was like, okay, we're canceling this. So mm. they canceled everything. And they were literally hiring people to work on this film and they had didn't, didn't even have a script. Oh, wow. So oh, unfortunately wow. they let a lot of them go and we were back down to five people again. Um, one, two, actually, I think it was down to four. Oh. Model texture artist. We had a, um, a TD, an animator, and then a rigger <laughs> and uh we all we're all in one room we all just sat around looking at each other and george said all right do anything you want and just make sure it's it's um uh, animated film centric so we what got, right it was crazy and so we worked on like animation tools and worked with ilm on um xeno and how to get all this stuff into a pipeline and we made this little one minute movie as a as our practice you know a practice piece um with like a little elf and a violin and and that was our thing and that was another year wow and then uh, that ended um <laughs> and then we all went back to ilm mm. for for rango 
Oh. Yeah, so Rango. And then by then I was like, okay, I'm comfortable now with the texturing and the modeling. Um, I'm up for anything. And they said, what do you want to do in Rango? And I said, texturing. So that's what it was. So it was a texture that's artist. like you, 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 you got like a rugged ship of a master class at George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. I am telling you, like, what's that quote? Like, success is being prepared and opportunity when meet or something like that. It sounds it was, about right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Preparedness and opportunity meet equals success or something. Like that. Yeah. So yeah. that's what it was. It was like being at the right time at the right place and giving this amazing opportunity just to freaking learn. And yeah. it was like, it's incredible because mm. you do a little bit of sim work over here on the side and you do some facial animation here because I was doing all the face shapes handing mm. them to the animator and she would kick them back and I'd make changes. And then it would just, it was just like a small little room of, of super talented people just making stuff work. It was like really, really. And then, you know, George would come in like once or twice a week and just look at the stuff. And it was like pretty crazy. Yeah. Like really yeah. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it sounds amazing. It's it's like one of those. Uh, I remember in our final year in animation school, we had uh, uh, Tom uh, Tom Moore uh, who did Song of the Sea and and um, like he, he has a, what was it? he has a studio in uh, in in Ireland where he's doing his two uh, D features and he he came and he talked and he uh, he said that you only have this opportunity in school or or it, 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 it may never come again to do your own thing. And we all laughed at him because we didn't, you know, like you can do whatever you want when you're done with school, but then of course you can't. <laughs> but then you, uh, got, you got another one of those opportunities in a small group of, of amazing people. That's, uh, yeah, that's extraordinary. I remember this was the first year and uh, we we're at, literally at the ranch in one of the houses in the back and they were doing, um, the animated Star Wars series there. Mm. Uh, so they they were in the building next to us, that crew, and then our little crew next door. And I remember in the summer, we would have the, these French doors open on, at the ranch on, uh, of this little cabin we were in, out into this courtyard. And then at five o'clock, all the deer would come in and just like hang outside your window. Oh. And, you know, it was just crazy, all these deer, and they would like pop their head in and look around and we got to know them because like one had this really wonky eyeball that was all popped out of his head. And we're like, ew, it's a creepy one. <laughs> and I would tell this to my theater friends, right? Cause I've yeah. uh, gone for years and I would go home every year for Christmas. And I'm like, I would do this. And I said, I felt like, um, Who's that Disney character that has all the birds on her shoulders? La, 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 la. <laughs> da, da, da. And there yeah. I am on my computer, this deer looking in. It was just like, this is insane. It was so cool. So yeah. very, 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 very cool. Mm. And then, um, and just having conversations with George, like he would come and do, like walk around your desk and look at your work. And I remember I made him laugh at one point with some stupid joke I made. It's just, it was an incredible, incredible, incredible yeah. experience. Very thankful. Yeah. Learned a ton. Um, oh, yeah, life changing. How often would he come in? Like twice a week, Tuesday, twice Thursday. A week. Yeah. Wow. And was he, how was he as a supervisor? Um, uh, amazing. Yeah. He, he's a very, very humble man, very quiet. Um, he knows exactly, that's the thing, like he knows exactly what he wants. The man's got a vision. You got to give him mm. that, right? Yeah. Um, that's sort of a little bit of a, um, something I've learned like in skip ahead 15 or 10 years, I guess, from there. And some of the directors that we work with now, I've, uh, I've never worked with visual effects, so they don't have a vision. So they want us to create their vision, which takes time and iterations and late nights and all this stuff. <laughs> But George knew exactly what he, he knows exactly what he wants, right? I want mm. this, 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 and then sometimes he'd say, "Go play," of course. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But very humble, very quiet, very humble man. Mm. And did you did you bring some of that uh, into you? It it sounds like you're echoing the even keel like uh, supervisor, it, like that was what you said you before that that's, that's what you aimed for. But I feel like the, because I'm. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, I, Sorry. 
no, 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 not at all. No, I was just thinking uh, um, because I, I've worked with uh, directors who didn't know what they wanted as well, and it can delay or or throw a production into chaos because <laughs> because nobody really knows. But then, yeah. then you, uh, I heard this story about um, uh, um, oh, his his name uh, uh, Del Toro and on the um, on Pacific Rim. How, <gasps> yeah, how he had this, I, I, I don't know how true it is, so I'll be careful. But what I heard is that he had this linear approach that once he approved something, he would very rarely go back so mm. that everything would go forward, like move ahead. And, you know, like you talked earlier about n avoiding uh, updates or, or redos or like he would just, everything would move ahead so that they actually came in under budget on Pacific Rim, which is already an insane production it looked so expensive as it was i worked but... on that yeah, oh you I did came, i did like i came in half i think the last half oh, and it's... i didn't have a lot to do i just did guts and gore okay if somebody was cut in half i did that if something <laughs> bled or oozed i did that if, well i maybe... just remember doing damage and gore mm. well maybe you can con confirm or disconfirm my rumor or how was I... it um once again, like the shots were done ah, when okay. I got them, so I was a little late to there to mm. that. Um, so that I don't know. I mean, mm. I only saw him wandering around giving notes at people's desks like once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, and then I do remember one general story. Like at the very end, we're all in the big theater, and I think we we're about to watch it for the first time. And mm. he came in and they gave him the microphone. He was just like so appreciative and so funny. He's super <laughs> funny, a foul mouth, right? And he's really <laughs> awesome. And I remember him saying, um, oh, ILM, you're, you're amazing, man, but you're so fucking expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody just roared. They just thought that was hilarious. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah, at the, yeah, I was doing like uh, triage <laughs> at mm. that point, just fixes and gore and yeah, you know, like, so yeah, yeah. That well, that's a big part of it. Uh, the 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 shot fi the fixing stuff by shot. It's yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I I wonder when you found yourself in a supervising role, did you did you have those kind of like memories of what you wanted to bring from uh, George Clu uh, Lucas uh, and then. Uh, you talked about uh, the the idol you had, the supervisor who taught you, and you wanted to. Absolutely, in, yeah. I, there's also um, uh, another person I'm going to give a shout out to um, is my dance mentor Gino Berti, mm. and when I was young and terrible and. Uh, uh, I was just this long, lanky guy that could, who was super flexible and I could turn. And when you're, <laughs> you know, six feet tall and a male, sometimes that's all you need to get in a show back in the day, right? <laughs> like the, the, the crappier, I shouldn't say crappy shows, the uh, uh, less prominent of course. productions yeah. like that. And, um, uh, and he was awesome and he would clean up my choreography just like you'd clean up animation right he's like what do you do fix that fix that mm. and he was like you got to take class are you taking class i'm like well i tell you he's like no you got to take this one this one are you taking ballet classes i'm like no i hate ballet get the ballet class blah 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 so he was he's like oh i heard about an audition you'll need this this don't be late you got to mm. get it early all that stuff and uh, he was amazing and he was another one that as he was he's now a choreographer he always took care of his dancers they were always his children. He was always making sure they were happy and healthy and um, questions answered and then making sure the production. So there was a lot of um, uh, lessons learned from Gino as well as mm. Jeff. Gino and Jeff, yeah. yeah. Just about um, taking care of your team, which I think is almost number one, really. Mm. Because at the end of the day, um, you have to walk out the door and go home to your families and all that stuff. And the movie may bomb or the movie may be incredible, but most likely forgotten after the opening weekend and your stress and your, and your overworked and your unhealthy habits and stuff last way longer. Right. So mm. that, I think I tried to make sure that my artists were happy and healthy 
as mm. best they could anyway. If yeah. they needed time off to go to a, go and do something with their family for two days, and make sure that they could do that so they could just function because mm. we know these environments are getting very uh, uh, time consuming, late nights and, yeah. you know, sometimes toxic, right? So you have to be able to survive this career yeah and uh, not burn out like i did and get bitter and like screw this i'm done i'm gonna paint <laughs> freaking fish from now on <laughs> yeah. it, it it's it's beautiful to hear you say how you because it's it, it, those notes of of happy and healthy and with the dancing it sounds very physical and then at lm everyone is just sitting hunched over their computer but and it's easy to forget that we are also beings in a body where we need we need fresh air and we need to uh, uh, we need more values than just the, the the tick box of approved on our screen. We need to feel uh, appreciated and 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 yeah. taken care of and all that stuff. Where I I could see that that maybe that's something that would show more in a theater group. Um, but but it's cool to see how you kind of took those ideals with you into VFX. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Sorry, did you want to add something? I was gonna say I don't. Sometimes I like I know supervisors have like two kids and mm. uh, a lengthy commute and other um, issues. I, mean, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, yeah. It it is like a pretty incredible feat to juggle, um, you know, because sometimes some shows you are there many hours. And if you're working with different cities, you got to stay a little bit longer because they're just getting up that day. So you got to start yeah. your meetings at six o'clock when most people are putting on their coat to go at the door. Yeah. You're there for another couple of hours. And then, yeah. So if you've got kids, you got to pick up a daycare. Like it gets complicated. So um, hats off to people that do that. It is unbelievable. Yeah. I have like literally nothing, right? I've got a couple of plants. <laughs> and for me, it was work. So yeah, it's incredible that they were able that they can do that. Mm. Amazing. So, so uh, do you have any? Was it just not just was it pressure over time that made you f that that made that burnout uh, feel more apparent? Or uh, it was it was, but it was also similar. To the theater, um, I had um, like a bucket list of productions and things I wanted to work on. We mm. all wanted to work on Star Wars and the right. Jurassic and Terminator, if, you know, and all that stuff. And I was super, super, super lucky that I was able to work on those. So mm. the productions that were coming in, I was like, you know, a lot of sequels yeah. and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this is a good time. Maybe mm. this is a good time. And um, and it was also another time where um, I'm trying not to get canceled here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find a I'll find a beep button if I have to. All right. Um, yeah, sort of gone. You, we're both canceled after this. Um, <laughs> try. Yeah, just like schedules are getting really hectic. Yeah. And um, tensions were rising. And one show would finish and it's like okay that was horrible i never want to do that again and then the next show starts and it's the same thing and it, day one it's already here you're already doing ot on day one i'm like wow this is is this it is this what mm. um, visual effects has now become because now that there's tv and netflix and it's visual effects it's everywhere and there's so much work and yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so i thought okay peace out i think this is my time to take a take a break, take a sabbatical mm. and just find a new, cause I was definitely not healthy. That's for sure. I was stressed out, drinking too much, mm. gaining weight, um, resenting happy people, believe mm. it or not. I would walk down the street and I'd see, you know, a couple having coffee and I'm just like, what, where do you get the time to do that? You know, I got like stuff to do. And it, I started to just in my brain, just not be a yeah. healthy person. So I, it was a perfect time for me to, uh, pull the plug and just get centered again and you know find your you know inner artist and just reconnect again with my family for god's sakes and mm. um, just art and just slow down yeah know? yeah and i don't i don't think that's uh 
have to be particular for one studio. It's I think that can be an industrial, uh, an industry wide uh, issue. The 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 hour, long hours, the OT and the burnouts. Like we've all been there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, so I don't I don't think anyone will will. You know that there's, I don't think you're stepping on any toes by saying that it's uh, it's just a, a, there's a time and a place. Um, and when, like you said, when you were young and you were uh, when you when you were getting out of theater and you would have done those hours gladly, right? Because you were hungry and that's yeah. your passion, right? So, so, um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's when you when you when you just mentioned finding your or reconnecting with your inner artist, it, it's it's curious how you, I can imagine you having a similar experience moving into VFX, but then it's like the artist leaves at a point, maybe because it, it becomes something else than, uh, than, than what feels like artistry. <laughs> do you, do oh, you, 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 you sacrifice your creativity for an administrative job, right? Mm, Which I yeah. was always sort of, pushing against. And um, I remember I had an interview after I left ILM um, with another company and their job, their offer was no time on the box, mm. all administrative. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that would be a tough job as an artist to know that you're just managing artists. And I thought, am I an artist manager or am I an artist? Mm. You know, and I thought maybe I should do it. It could be kind of good for my resume and stuff, but um, I just couldn't do it. Yeah, I needed to create still, I still had stuff I needed to create. And mm. um, uh, once again, on get stuff on, off my bucket list. Mm. And then yeah. the, the was the, I guess the painting was something in the background that just you that came to the front then i started painting in the late 80s and just for stuff on my walls and um um fell in love with john singer Sargent and these giant life-size portraits i love them i don't know why but i just totally fell in love with his work and uh so i started painting those and i um, was asked to put some up in a Italian restaurant in Toronto. So I did that for a while and that was pretty cool. And mm. did a couple of portrait commissions while I was on tour, um, which was kind of fun. It got, got me back into it. And then um, when I left theater just before starting um, in San Francisco with ILM, I did another portrait commission, which was great. Um, and then I didn't paint at all for a long time, like 12 years, I think. Mm. And then like three years before leaving San Francisco, I started painting again. It was just like, oh man, I, I really like this. Yeah, mm. I'm not, wasn't necessarily particularly good at it, but I liked the finished product of this huge, large, you know, painting that you could hang on the wall. Mm. I love that sort of fantasy, I guess, of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, that's when the savings started. It was like, all right, let's save for a rainy day because you you're going to want to do this full time. Mm. And that that realization came to you over time, or was it fairly quick that you realized, okay, this is something I need to pursue at one point? Over time, yeah, yeah, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a necessarily an overnight. It was always something I wanted, right? Mm. You know, I think that's like the dream is live that bohemian lifestyle oh, yes. of being on a beach and painting in a straw hat <laughs> and you know, selling your works at the market and, you know, living like, you know, that would be, that's the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so. Well, it seems like you're on your way there on your steep lear learning curve once again. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious because it's, uh, it, you were saying like you were watching tutorials at night and painting during the day and, um, yeah yeah it's it's that's it's amazing and and uh yeah i'm um well i can also see that there was just one of the koi ones were, were those behind you were those the early the the first like full time that you went into uh yes i painted that here after ilm and uh there's a yeah like 
Um, I was telling you, like, I'm living in this tiny little <laughs> yeah. in, in Vancouver and just off screen, like, it's all pure chaos. Like, if I tilt my computer, over, <laughs> I do it my palette and brushes and all this smelly stuff over here. It's very bohemian. <laughs> over here, there's this giant in the works koi oh, painting that's, that's right next to me. That's just, so this is where I sit. Oh, here's where I drop my computer. This is where I sit. Um, I actually I sit like this and I paint here and um, I have my reference on my computer and then the palette sits here and, mm. and then I got these lights there and there mm. and light up so I can paint um, in these dark Vancouver days. Yeah. yeah. And dude, I'm curious, like, uh, because you've been training your eyes in VFX so long, like that, that's uh, the, the, there's there's always something uh, in the early stages of a, of a production of a movie. I think a lot of us have that feeling where it's like, this is never going to be any good. But then you get used to the process of it looking like shit. And then a hundred iterations later, it's in the theaters and it, it, it it's great. Do you do you do you have that thing with your paintings as well? Like do you absolutely have... <laughs> yeah. every single painting goes the same three stages and i just i don't understand why the first stage is the fun stage right brand new big canvas and you put your new something new and you're excited and yeah. then like a week after the, so my paintings take a long time they take four weeks they're like mm. they're usually pretty big like five feet and for mm. some reason they just always take me four weeks mm. so those two middle weeks is when i miserable <laughs> I can't tell if it's working. It's so much work ahead of me. It's work to actually get the paint out and start painting. And it's the hardest part. And then just there's this sweet spot where it leaves that and starts to go into the final stretch. And it's and then I, I'm inspired. Then I'm like, oh, that's it. Ooh, that's working. And then I feel better. Mm. But it's the same every time. And I wish I f knew a way to convince myself that those two middle weeks or that middle where everything, like you said, is shit and it's not going to work. I wish I knew I could convince myself, you know, it's going to be fine. Just push through, you know, mm. it might be because like, I've got a, like a few paintings that just fail mm. and they're big and they're in my closet. And no one's ever going to see them. And they, you work on them for weeks. One I've been working on for two months mm. off and on, and it's just crap. And I can't <laughs> seem to get it where I want it. And it's just, uh, uh, it angers me because it was two months of my, in my yeah. limited time, you know, that I have to do this before the money runs out. Yeah. So uh, I feel like I get worried that those two weeks is a make uh, or break. Yeah. So it's, uh, but yeah. No, it's so it's it's so interesting hearing you say that because it sounds like, uh, like it's it it sounds like when you're something in something that still feels fresh and the the meat is still juicy and you're still <laughs> in it, and 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 then those the middle part is is so uh, because it, it it's like it has the potential to do anything. You know, like, yes. and you you go from this megalomania or like, like oh, they're going to in, invent a new award just for me because this is amazing. And then five minutes later, it's like, the, I should burn everything. And it's like, and it's, I don't, I'm, I'm projecting, of course, but that's how I, I, how I would feel about animation when I was, when I was just, when it was all fresh, right? So, yeah. And, but of course, with that hardship also comes a, a bigger reward. And I wonder, I'm, I'm just playing devil, devil's advocate, but I wonder if when it all becomes too much of a even dramatic curve, if that's when you start to get bored. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, I don't maybe, know. maybe this is, yeah, the, maybe this is how it, it's supposed to be. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard because no one wants to advocate suffering, but <laughs> there, there, there's, yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting. What's more romantic than the suffering artist, right? I know. The artist, <laughs> not eating and, you know, putting the poisonous breath in his mouth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> artists that died, right? They yeah. The, <laughs> putting the lead paint yeah. in mouth. Oh, yeah. God. So, yeah. so, so do you, do you, uh, like this, this, this 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 drama these two weeks 
I, do you do you find yourself uh, missing the 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 safety net of uh, production and a steady paycheck and all that stuff? Oh, sure, absolutely. Mm. Um, I just wish, and I this is one thing that I probably failed at with visual effects is time or time management, personal time management, I guess, like mm -hmm. trying to find where I can have that job, be super busy and not be miserable. So you could enjoy this financial steadiness that the, the job gives you, right? Mm -hmm. These paychecks without being just bitter, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. And just like, ah, oh, the show's looking like crap. It's not going to be good. And we've been working on it for a year and a half. And I just wish that I could find this happy medium between a, a job that can, I don't know, that I can do well, I guess, and help and contribute and then not have it just be this burden. But I've never been able to do it ever. Mm -hmm. Like even back in my early theater days, like um, it, it's just something that I just have to make 24 hours a day. It's my passion. Mm. It's all I know is being an artist mm. and I love doing it. And um, yeah, I just wish I could find this happy medium. Maybe there isn't one. Mm. Maybe this is it. Maybe there's, it, maybe it's all a lie. Well, <laughs> well, it's also, it's an interesting, uh, that's, that's the dark side, right? And the, 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 the other side of it is that you, you've, 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 you've getting to live like at least three careers in the span of what most people just where most people just do one really well you get to do three really well because that's comes with you know when you put a lot of hours into something you're good at you become you you do great so it's there's also a bright side to it, it it's it's taking you to all these places and and uh, through all these adventures and awards and 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 stories oh, stories that's the most important stories. Piece. that is the most important thing at the at the yeah i hate saying that that phrase again and again but at the end of the day mm. yeah like stories to tell are the best yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um i just oh fuck it's like i'm trying to keep these not too long but yeah. <laughs> but it's just, this is so good um i, I just i I, I'm curious about the, the the we've we've kind of talked about the unhealthy habits of VFX, but I also like we talked about being like uh, I I just I just I just like like with a lot of hardship comes a lot of lessons as well, and and mm -hmm. and you must have learned so much from those. Uh, was it 17, 16, 17 years? Sixteen and a half years. Oof. Yeah. Yeah yeah um yes uh and talk about like a switch from working with a ton of people managing um uh different types of people working with different types of people mm. and then switching gears completely where i'm alone yeah days on end and then having to figure it all out i guess myself and find my own answers and solutions but the one, you know, um, takeaway, I guess, from visual effects is being organized and from theater is being prepared. Mm. So I guess I take those two things and, and keep them under my wing while I'm working away and making sure everything, the no unintentional horrors, <laughs> you know, except for, you know, people liking and not liking my work. I think that's about the, the only horror you know, but I think I've been thankful, uh, lucky enough, I should say, to learn a bunch of skills with, you know, uh, like, you know, as a dancer, it's all very visual, right? It's all mm. poses and um, pictures, uh, you know, you finish like this and you, everything is a picture and you train your eye and how the body should look and what's right. And I bring that into modeling for mm. anatomy. And then it, it also comes into my painting with composition. And so it all, I guess, feeds into each other, you know, one art career into another one. Um, and they all, I guess, support and help each other. And yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I just hope I can 
with this one at least. Well, you know what? I'm not even going to um, put too much pressure on myself. Mm. I'm pointing to this painting that's just off the screen all the time. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, I'm not to um, put too much pressure on myself. Like, yeah. If I, it's an experiment. If this works, fantastic. I'm going to give it my best effort because we, you know, we all hate regrets. Like, there's two yeah. kind of re regrets, right? One is I did something and I was made a fool of myself and I regret that. And then the other one is I didn't even try mm. and I regret not even trying. So that's the one I hate. So at least I will know that I've given it my best effort, um, however long it takes, however long I can stretch it out. Yeah. And get as best as I can with all this information I've gathered over the years mm. and see what I got. And who knows if I fall flat on my face, I'll be back painting robots. <laughs> well, it's not a, it's not a bad plan B. It isn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, when you know how to do it, it's not a, it's not a bad job, at least for a while. And, uh, We've all gone yeah. back for the money, so. <laughs> it, it, and like, what an amazing, um, uh, uh, lucky person that I can, you know, assuming that someone would hire me after spending so much time away, but uh, that I could go back and go back in working in freaking movies. Like, yeah. how incredible is that? So, yeah, yeah, I'm very, very, very thankful for all of that, for mm. sure. Mm. I, uh, I'm curious to, uh, um, I just want to, I just want to commend you on like, the, I, I thought a lot lately about what we're led by or what, what drives us forward. And I think it's so, it's very easy to, to be driven by fear of fear of not being appreciated or fear of, of all these things. And, and you were talking about a, a fear of not living up to what people expected, but That's it's, but it seems like at the end of the day, you're already you're led by curiosity, which I think is like this shining light because it's curiosity is kind of like it's it's it, it's inclusive. It's 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 for everyone. It's open and it's just it's you're not following anything because of a title or money or or, or a profit. You're following it because there's just something there. It's like a moment that stretches and you stay in it. So it's like and and it seems like that's always winning for you and it, it's it's very inspirational is yeah well the art yeah i never chose the art right i always say like the art chose me mm. because even when i was like a kid um i was doing it just like like a child i just it was just something i just started painting and drawing and um yeah so it's my uh yeah it's my uh inner thing that's just mm. pushing me forward you know um it sounds really no no yeah. it's, it's great yeah that's <laughs> kind of what it is that's all i know yeah, yeah yeah so do you do you have something is it gonna be painting for as long as you can see forward or you don't have to share it if you don't feel like it but i'm curious it's, uh so i have a my deadline I've given myself, um, which I shouldn't, but I did. So in May, I'm doing this big art show here in Vancouver called Art Vancouver. Oh, wow. And because of COVID, <laughs> it's been canceled. Like it, like they put it to April and then it's still not good. And then they put it to the uh, September and it's still, so they've been pushing it, pushing it and pushing it now for two years. Mm. Um, so May, beginning of may is when this is hopefully finally going to happen and so that's sort of where i'm working towards now i'm doing a couple of art i'm in an art show now and i'm going to do another moving another one uh paintings into another one next week mm. and then i got this other thing that's going on so i've got like little things on the go but then this art fair that's going to be in may mm. i'm going to have a booth and i've spent a couple of grand or a few grand and all that stuff so that is the moment of truth if it's good feedback i'm gonna keep going but if it's like i don't fit in or it's just my art isn't on trend or like there's all kinds of different things like if it mm. just doesn't work then i'll have to rethink the whole thing mm. and go from there but may is my little short-term deadline 
And what's the name of the event? It's called Art Vancouver. Mm. Yeah, um, like cities have them. Like there's Art Miami that's happening actually this weekend. And then there's Art Toronto that was two weekends ago. There's mm. like Art and then you add the city at the end. So Art Vancouver. Mm. And, uh, and it's like an international art fair. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make sure to post uh, that website and also for your work as well. Um, oh, I'm going to be throwing that stuff <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's another thing too. Like when you are just like a one man band, you yeah. have to do everything. You've got to do your promotion and you've got all this stuff and, and it's delicate because you got to make sure it's not obnoxious and it's got to be attractive and it's got to do all this. Mm. And I'm learning that stuff too, as well. And, you know, uh, putting up a proper website and make sure it's not too much of this and just enough of that yeah. and the website changes almost every week right mm. i'm always switching things around and taking out sections and and uh with the art career i'm like committing every sin you could possibly do like they want you to specialize you know paint one thing and i paint figures and still life and fish and they <laughs> they don't like that Mm. And I've got theater background and they don't care about that crap, but I'm putting it on my website anyway, mm. because it just shows, you know, the kind of where it all, all comes from, I guess. Mm. Anyway, I'm sure the people that look at, you know, the art galleries that I've been trying to get into are like, what is this guy all about? So who knows? Who knows? It's well, a journey. Exactly. And, uh, like I said, like the visual effects have given me the, the savings to, to be able to do this or else I'd never be able to do it. Never. Mm. Also sounds like they've given you some resilience. Uh, I'm sure theater did that as well because like being not very good and then getting very far is, is, is not a new thing for you. So, uh, no, that's like every career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crap. <laughs> Somebody gives me a break and then I learn and I get there and then I switch to the next one and I'm crap and then I sort of yeah. again. But I that's a that's a skill uh, in itself and and also like from what you've just shown us you're you're an amazing artist uh, with what what you're doing now so um I I Trying. Yeah, yeah yeah I don't, learning yeah. every day no, it's it's a huge inspiration, uh, and it's so cool to see how you've uh, put it all together and 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 are moving forward. Um, yeah, and I think maybe I will. I'll probably uh, get in touch with you about doing a part two, uh, and uh, and then. Um, yeah, I'll be. Yeah, you'll be interviewing me. I'll be living in a cardboard box under a bridge, <laughs> St painting on. <laughs> yeah, still, yeah. still very bohem though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And loving it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Martin, thank you so much for this. This was amazing. Um, Absolutely, thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm in such uh, incredible company uh, oh. with all your other interviews and like big shots in the visual effects world. So it's, um, yeah, I feel honored. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.